Hello, everyone. My name is Eileen McIntyre, and we're going to be starting our program now. To introduce the program, first we'll hear from Deirdre Anderson on behalf of the Hingham Historical Society. Deirdre? Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Eileen. Welcome to our sixth lecture and our seventh event in the Benjamin Lincoln World Lecture Series, which has been running since September, and many of you have joined us since that time. Thank you so much for your support. I would also like to give a sincere thanks to our education committee, ably led by Eileen McIntyre and Elizabeth Dane, who have led us in this serious time of transition as we went to an all virtual lecture series. In this time, Elizabeth Dane has transitioned off our board after two terms of service. And we are so grateful for all that she contributed, especially her creativity and elegance in delivering some of the home, uh, home delivered treats that we thought might augment the new world of experiencing these lectures um, alone in our homes versus together at the Hingham Heritage Museum. So we are so grateful for Elizabeth's service to the society and we look forward to her staying close. Um, I would like to share with you some of the programs that the Hingham Historical Society has in the month ahead and we hope to, to see you at some of them. Uh, every week, we are offering walking tours of historic downtown Hingham for those of you who are local. We depart the Hingham Heritage Museum on Thursdays and Fridays at 3 p.m. You can also tune in to our virtual tours of Old Ordinary at 1 p.m. on Saturdays. We also have on exhibition at the Hingham Heritage Museum, Picturing Hingham, the art of Louis and Beatrice Baxter Ryle. Uh, some wonderful familiar Hingham scenes as well as some not so familiar scenes uh, that we welcome you to come and see on Fridays and Saturdays from 11 to 3 p.m. We also welcome you, yesterday was our, our inaugural Springham. We wanted to welcome the world back in a vaccinated, uh, vaccinated way and, and be nimble. And so we are launching a concert series uh, every Saturday from two to 5 p.m. at the Hingham Heritage Museum. And we had a wonderful showing yesterday of a lot of people coming out after a long year of isolation. It's our effort to um, help people understand what we do at the Hingham Heritage Museum and throw open our doors wide. Um, again, that's every Saturday through Memorial Day from two to 5 p.m. The exception is on Saturday, May 8th, is Hingham's annual town meeting outside. So um, we will hold that weekend's concert on Friday night, May 7th from 5 to 7 p.m. And we hope if you wanna stroll by for a song or stay for the show, we would love to see you in person. And finally, before next month's lecture, we will be sending to you a survey where we would love to get your feedback on this year's program and what your hopes and dreams and expectations might be for our future lecture series. Do you think you'll continue to watch them virtually? Do you think you'd come back to the Hingham Heritage Museum? We'd love to find out your feedback um, on this, this series that we've had so much fun gathering with all of you um, over the, these last many months. So again, thank you all so much for your support. My sincere thanks to the Education Committee and of course our lecturers. And I will turn it back to Eileen. Thank you, Deirdre. And I just heard that there's some reverb on my microphone. I apologize for that, but you will not be hearing from me for too much longer because our speaker will take over. So I will try and speak slowly to overcome that. Thank you for joining us today. Once again, as Deirdre said, this is our seventh program in the Benjamin Lincoln's world, stories from colonial Hingham to the early Republic. So on behalf of both the board of directors and the education committee, welcome. Our guest presenter today, Michelle Marchetti Coughlin, is an historian with particular expertise on the topic of colonial New England women. In earlier programs in our Benjamin Lincoln's World series about colonial education and home-based beer making, for example, we have heard tantalizing clues about the lifestyles and far-ranging responsibilities of colonial women. Michelle's presentation today will allow us to get a fuller picture of the challenges such women faced 
uh, and the opportunities that they seized. Michelle is the author of two biographies, one about the life and writings of Mehetabel Chandler Coit, and her most recent book about the life of Penelope Winslow, who became one of the most influential women in Plymouth Colony. Historian Rebecca Fraser has said of this work, quote, with exemplary scholarship, Michelle Marchetti Coughlin's rich and fascinating book uncovers the hidden truth about Plymouth Colony's first lady, the complex Penelope Pelham Winslow, end quote. If you're interested in reading, e reading either of Michelle's books, just click on the links that were provided in the e email you received with the Zoom code today. Michelle also is guest curator for the current exhibit at the Pilgrim Hall Museum titled Path Founders, Women of Plymouth. The exhibit resets the 400 years since the Pilgrims settled in Plymouth by focusing on the lives and legacies of path founding women. As we all get vaccinated, this sounds like a great reason to drive down to Plymouth. Well, at the conclusion of Michelle's formal remarks, which should run about 40 minutes, we will have time to respond to questions from the audience. So please submit questions at any time during the program by using the Q&A feature on Zoom, which is a button you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now I welcome Michelle Marchetti Coughlin. Michelle. Great, thank you so much, Eileen. And thank you, Deirdre. And, uh, Thank you to the Hingham Historical Society. And I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Um, so, and thank you, you know, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I have a feeling a lot of you probably know uh, perhaps quite a bit about colonial women and you probably have learned more during the course of this series. So today I wanna to focus on some perspectives that may not be as familiar and that take place within the founding years of the of the um, country, the settle, you know, the first years of settlement. So all women in colonial America lived under a system of patriarchy in which their actions were constrained because of their gender. And uh, within uh, when a woman got married, for example, she uh, lived under an English tradition of coverture and she became known as a femme covert, literally a covered woman. And her uh, legal identity, her very personhood were subsumed by those of her husband. But within these constraints, there existed an astonishing range of experiences for women despite th that depended um, on their race, their ethnicity, their religion, their socioeconomic status, where they lived and what exact time period they lived in. And historians have really only just begun to plumb the depth and the range of these experiences in the past few decades. It really took the women's movement of the 1960s to, to get women's history going and also the development of social history, which stressed the importance of researching the experiences of all people, not just white male leaders. So uh, today I'm focusing on New England women just for the sake of time, uh, because there, as I said, there are so many, such a range of experiences to uh, look into, but I'm talking about New England women and I'm gonna start by introducing you to this woman here, actually she's a girl, her name is Mary Mason, and she is Abigail Adams's great grandmother. And uh, when I saw this picture, I, you know, as, as I serve on the board of the Abigail Adams birthplace, and I saw this picture, I became intrigued by who this person was. I discovered she actually married the Reverend John Norton, um, the first minister at the newly built old ship meeting house in 1681. And she and John were they're really a, a very fascinating couple. I ended up writing an article about them and I'm gonna talk a little bit about them today. And, and it's another strange little um, coincidence. I discovered that just recently that Mary and John's son, another John was the first, uh, their son was the first husband of Benjamin Lincoln's mother. So his mother had another husband before she married his father. So anyway, um, I'm going to segue into this story by talking about childhood. 
Uh, and here are some other portraits of uh, Mary Mason's siblings. They were painted by the same artist in 1670. We don't know who the artist was. But I want to uh, start by talking about childhood by addressing some lingering notions we have about colonial childhood that there really wasn't a, a childhood. The children didn't really experience the childhood in the way that we know it today. That's absolutely true. But children were allowed to play and have fun. And I think part of this uh, perception about what childhood was like developed be, as a result of some stereotypes, lingering stereotypes we have about the Puritans. And so, so of course, early New England was a Puritan society. Uh, and to just give a quick recap, we know that Plymouth Colony, founded in 1620, was settled by the Pilgrims, the people we know as the Pilgrims. They wanted to, um, to oversimplify, they wanted to uh, separate from the church, the established Church of England. The Puritans wanted to purify that church. The, the two groups, the Pilgrims and the Puritans, had many views in common. Um, and so they both have gotten kind of a bad rap for not, not being fun people. We think of them as very sober, repressive, uh, and it's, it's really not the case. Not the case. I'm really going to try and shed a little bit more light on that um, in the course of this talk. But so, for example, fun. The Puritans were not against fun, uh, but they believed that everything should be done in moderation. They really looked, they really appreciated uh, all the good things in life as gifts from God. So they liked good food, they liked to drink, they liked to socialize. They only had a problem when, when those things were abused because they thought that that was, it was a sin against God because you're abusing this gift. And also it was undermining the society, um, this godly society they were trying so hard to build. So the Puritans also believed that everyone should have a direct relationship with God as mediated through scripture. So as a result, reading became very important in literacy because they believed everyone should be able to read the Bible. So this was a very well-read society. Uh, boys as well as girls went to school, learned how to read. Um, they often started out by going to dame schools, which were so-called because they were taught by women in their homes. And then boys often went ahead to a grammar school. Sometimes girls did too, but that wasn't typical. Uh, the boys would get additional education. Girls would get any, uh, typically would get any, any additional education at home from their own mother. And this uh, additional education would include writing because it was the time, at the time it was believed that everyone should be able to read, even uh, servants and enslaved people so they could read the Bible. But writing was looked upon as a specialized job related skill that really wasn't necessary for girls to learn. So those girls that did learn how to write learned from their mother. But, so women were very involved in education, as I mentioned, you know, as teachers in the dame schools. And I'm going to just show you a couple of uh, excerpts here. This is a great quote from the will of Deacon Samuel Fuller of Plymouth. As early as 1633, he's saying in his will, he wants both his son and his daughter to go to school with, uh, with Mrs. Hicks. So she's clearly running a school in her home. And this is another um, quote. Uh, Edward Winslow is writing to his brother John, saying that although John's son Pelham is still under the tuition of Mr. Ward in Boston, John's son Isaac remains with his mother, his grandmother at Marshfield, who, I love this line, thinks she can teach as well as anyone. So again, women were very involved in education in, in various ways. Now, uh, women did learn, of course, a number of housewifery sk skills from their mother too. These were you know, very important to learn, but there were layers of knowledge. So some, some very specialized layers of knowledge too. Um, now, I'm, I'm showing here a couple of pages from the diary of Mahinable Chandler Coit, who was the subject of my first book. And these are medical remedies that she had, some of the medical remedies she had in her diary. And so this is a very specialized area of knowledge that was transmitted from mother to daughter uh, because women at the time, you know, especially in the early years where there were very few professionally trained doctors around, women continued the tradition of caring for their families, um, the health and well-being of their families, but also the community. So, you know, there were midwives and healers and they would often have, um, you know, grow medicinal herbs in their garden. 
So again, this is a, a very specialized layer of knowledge that goes beyond just how to heat house. And when we're thinking of this type of transmission of knowledge, we also have to widen our perspective and think about native women, because of course they were here for thousands of years before the colonists came. And these are just a couple of simple pictures showing um, there's a native woman making a pot and another woman mending. And of course, these would be the types of skills that a native woman would pass down to her own daughter. But again, there are other layers of more specialized knowledge. Uh, women in many native tribes were actually the chief agricultural workers. So they're, they're in charge of raising all the food for their community. So this is knowledge that would be passed down from mother to daughter. And also what's interesting about um, many native tribes is that land and property were passed down from mother to daughter, not from father to son as was typical, typical with the colonists. So again, just something that we have to, we have to dig deeper when we're thinking about colonial women. Uh, and another layer to this too, is that native women could have, while a colonial woman could hold a lot of informal power in their society, they were not a part of the formal political process. Native women, on the other hand, could hold posts as diplomats, as spiritual leaders, and also as tribal leaders. So it just brings another you know, dimension to the story when we're thinking about Native women's experiences. And then of course, we also have to think about African and African-American women's experiences. And I know there was a program in this series that had to do with slavery. So I know you're all familiar with the fact that slavery was a longstanding custom uh, in New England, unfortunately. The numbers of enslaved people in New England was never very large but they were absolutely an integral part of the population. They were present in many, many communities. And so to get at their stories and to get at the stories of people who didn't leave behind written records like native peoples and like many women, we have to look at a range of sources. And one source that I particularly like and find very useful is archeology. span And we're very lucky because so many archeological excavations have been done in our area. And so I'm showing here, um, this is a cowrie shell. This was actually not taken locally, but it was dug up at the Monticello slave quarters. And a similar one was found on the property of the Winslow House Museum in Marshfield. There were enslaved people who lived there. And this cowrie shell is important because these shells were used as, uh, as currency and jewelry and religious artifacts by African people. So it's just showing how they're maintaining their culture they're living in Puritan New England, but they're maintaining their culture too. And then this is um, this other image I have here relates to a story in an archaeological report from the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford, which you may be familiar with. So they found a lot of berry seeds on the, uh, the site of the slave quarters, and they discussed how women and girls would have been responsible for berry picking and how be, this became um, an excursion that they enjoyed because they could get away from you know, the master and mistress. They could have time to themselves and exchange stories and exchange knowledge. And you know, so again, it's a, it's a different way of looking at history, but we really have to be creative when we're trying to recover the experiences of people who don't uh, show up much in the formal written records. So all English girls, all colonial girls were expected to marry. And courtship was a very important process. It was again, different than what we know of today, but it was, it, it absolutely did involve an element of romant, romantic love and affection. So we you know, have these stereotypes of perhaps marriages being arranged uh, and that the, the parties involved were very young, but that's not true. Uh, parental approval was very important, but marriages were not, by and large, were not arranged. And also women were typically in their early 20s when they married. Men tended to be a couple of years older because they had to be established enough to be able to support a family. And um, I'm going to show you a great uh, letter from John Norton to Mary Mason before they were married. And you can see, you know, it's just, it's just so wonderful because he's expressing how much he misses her. And I'm going to just quote a bit from it. 
Um, these lines are only in haste to tell you that my body is here at Hingham in good order and health. As for, as for my heart, I must require of it an account of it from yourself, for I left that with you at Boston. Very sweet. And then he has this little poem at the end. So when we look at the um, letters between uh, couples who are courting or even married couples, we see this element of romantic love that you might not associate with the pilgrim, the, with the Puritans. But also uh, it was very important despite the tradition of coverture, despite the fact that the man would be the head of the household, Puritan ministers encouraged loving partnerships. And we, um, you know, we think of them as the Puritans as sexually repressive. Well, ministers were actually encouraging physical closeness between husbands and wives. They thought it was a very important part of marriage. Now, again, in their view where they, they saw a certain place uh, in time for things, they did not think that sex outside of marriage was a good thing. And yet when we look at the records, we see that there are a lot of premarital pregnancies in early New England. And there's actually an interesting reason for this. Um, one is, of course, that young people will be young people, but also because there is a tradition, uh, there was a longstanding tradition brought over from England that couples, when they became betrothed to each other, so becoming married, there was a, a whole process to become married. You would first become betrothed, and that was a, that was a very serious arrangement. And if you broke a betrothal, you could actually be sued. And then you, you know, publish the bans on the meeting house or these steps that, that tended to be followed. But sometimes young people perceived their married state as being as starting when they became betrothed. So that, that, that explains a lot of the premarital pregnancy. Um, and also couples who were um, found guilty of this were typically, you know, they were censured for this, but then it didn't cause any lasting repercussions, any lasting negative damage to their reputations. And again, this is a, another important facet of early New England society is that the standards were high and if you transgressed, you, you would have you would be called to account for it. But if you truly repented, you were welcomed back into the community because they wanted to have a community that was operating together to move toward this goal of, you've heard that term, being a city upon a hill, that they really wanted to make this experiment work. So here's some, some great portraits. Now this is Penelope Winslow on the left. And she married Josiah, I'm sorry, Penelope Pelham, she married Josiah Winslow. These were painted in around 1651 uh, in probably in London. Now, when couples chose a mate, as I mentioned, they wanted to have, there was an attraction was important, but also important were similar religious views and a similar socioeconomic status. So Josiah Winslow, it was the son of pilgrim Edward Winslow, who was a governor of Plymouth Colony. Josiah became the first native born governor of Plymouth Colony. And Penelope Winslow was born in England and she was a member of the English gentry. In fact, her third great grandmother was Mary Boleyn, whom you may have uh, heard referred to as the other Boleyn girl. She emigrated when she was young and her father became the first treasurer of Harvard. So this was a good match because they were both from this elite uh, strata of society. Uh, I wanna take a minute to point out the clothing that they're wearing. Again, we have the, you know, these stereotypical views of Puritans wearing black. Well, Josiah's wearing black here, but that's because he wants to display his wealth because black is a very expensive dye and at the time the portraits were painted, it was a very fashionable color to wear. And you can see he's offsetting his black with a, you know, a white starched collar and a gold tassel. And Penelope, her, you know, she doesn't look like probably what you envision as a Puritan woman looking like. She's dressing according to her, st her status. Um, status was so important at this time period in the 17th century and, and early 18th century that a high ranking woman could potentially wield more power than a low ranking propertyless man. So this is a time before gender is the all defining element of a woman's life. So I was interested in Penelope's story because I wanted to find out what, you know, she as the governor's wife and with her gentry background, what she did as the arguably one of the most powerful women in Plymouth Colony's history. So again, it just 
this is something that is not as well known about this, you know, the status being so important that it, it trumped gender, it could trump gender in a woman's life. Now, of course, the um, one of the primary events of a marriage would result in motherhood. This is another great early portrait. This is perhaps done by the same portrait who did the Mason children. And I'm showing, um, just wanted to show these, these other pictures here. So we have the uh, cradle that Susanna White is supposed to have brought, brought over on the Mayflower for her son Peregrine, whom she gave birth to um, in Provincetown Harbor. Peregrine was the first English child born in New England. And then we have uh, Josiah Winslow's baby shoes. So motherhood, uh, if, a, if a woman gets married in her early 20s, and it's, women typically had children every couple of years, um, their childbearing years could last decades. In fact, they could be having their final children when their oldest children are starting their own families. Um, and of course, you know, motherhood, motherhood did involve uh, dangers. It was, it was dangerous to go through childbirth and, and women were afraid of this and they prepared themselves for this. Women typically though ha did have large families. I think in the first uh, generation, Native born generation in Plymouth, I think uh, women had seven, an average of seven children. It increased to eight children the next generation and nine the following generation. And kinship and family were very important. Um, not just your nuclear family, but also extended, your extended kinship network, not just because they're your relatives and you love them, but because they're, they're helpful with social connections and they're also helpful with economic connections. And so this isn't just true with the colonists, it's also true kinship uh, networks were very important for native peoples in African peoples too. So unfortunately um, for native peoples, these uh, connections were disrupted by warfare that broke out. And then you know, some native peoples were sold into slavery and many were uh, displaced, lost their traditional lands. And for African peoples, of course, they had the most fragile family system because spouses often did not uh, typically belong to the same owner. And so, and their children, you know, would be, they would go with the mother, but could be sold away. So the spouses could be sold away from each other. The children could be sold away. And this is really evident too. It's very sad to see in early Boston newspapers. So, um, but the Puritan family was, was thriving during this time period, despite the number, there was a, a high rate of childhood mortality. Um, I think basically one in 10 children might not survive. If you were in an urban area, it could be as high as three in 10. And this is because of illness. But there were other, other dangers for children. And uh, Mahitable Chandler Coit actually, on one of the pages in her diary, she went to the trouble to record the exact date that her children had met with accidents. So we have her son, Billy, fell into a cove and was almost drowned. Her daughter, Martha's foot, was burned with a warming pan. And then uh, her husband was a, um, owned a shipyard. And so her son, Thomas, was at the shipyard. A plank fell on him, uh, but he got no great matter of hurt. So that was good. But sadly, she did lose children. And she records that here. Her son, Samuel, died when he was four. Her son, Thomas, died when he was in his early 20s. And her daughter Elizabeth died when she was in her early 20s. So, you know, just very sad, but um, we also have this perception that parents perhaps were not as attached to their children because they knew the dangers, but I don't really think that's the case. I think they absolutely understood the dangers and that they might, that they might lose children. But you see in letters, uh, in other references from the period when someone loses a child, it's, it's devastating to them. So religion. So I have to show here Old Chip uh, Meeting House in Hingham, uh, which is believed to be the oldest uh, Puritan meeting house in continuous operation. Um, now, I talked a bit about religion, obviously, but to further explore the, the importance of the of Puritan religion to people's lives, um, we have to set it up by saying how the Puritans believed that everyone was preordained either for salvation, going to heaven, or damnation, going to hell. 
and you could never know which, which your fate was. So you had to keep trying to be, to receive God's grace. You had to keep pursuing your, you know, you had to pray and you had to be very introspective. And you also wanted to become a full member of the church if you could. And to become a full member of the church, you had to undergo a conversion experience. And this was a, um, an experience of having received God's grace. And you would have to describe this experience to your minister and perhaps the whole congregation. And I have some records here, uh, just a couple of records from the First Church of Boston. And uh, this, this first set from 1633, I highlighted because of these four women who were admitted, two of them are maid servants. And then the second um, set here, we have Jean described as a Negro. She may have been an enslaved person. So I want to highlight how church membership was available to all people. But I also want to, again, just dive a little bit deeper. Um, church membership gave women status, but also it gave them a little room to carve out some time for themselves because women were supposed to be engaged, as I said, in, this, in reading scripture, in soul searching, in praying. And so you can kind of see how women might use that time, you know, to get a few minutes alone to just collect their thoughts. And I'm not undermining their commitment to their, uh, their uh, religion. I'm just looking at the reality of, you know, what they experienced on a daily basis. And again, to look at that reality. So despite a woman's commitment to the, the Puritan religion, um, it was very common for them to maintain folk beliefs. Uh, that it, they coexisted alongside the, these mainstream, or they weren't mainstream, but the Puritan Christian beliefs. So there's evidence, for example, that Native people and um, African people and African American people who converted to Christianity also maintain their own spiritual beliefs. There's evidence that they're still doing this. And there's also evidence with the colonists because they, they still you know, retain an, a belief in magic um, that's why we, you'll see sometimes a hex mark on an old house or um, the Hittable Chandler Quaid has a couple of magical remedies in her diary. Um, so they, they just held on to these folk traditions too. So it was, you know, just, that it just so fascinating to me that they coexisted, these two strains of belief. Um, Hittable Quaid's mother went to the trouble of writing down this, it was an autobiographical account of her trying to find grace. She talks about all of these um, challenges in challenging situations she had to overcome in her life. And so this is just an excerpt from a poem she wrote. It's actually 64 page poem, 64 pages. So women again were very literate, they're very thoughtful. There are other examples of this type of, um, of poetry. Uh, but not 64 pages, this is unusual. But um, so again, this is a, a very interesting and important document from early America. Now, women in the Baptist and Quaker churches could actually hold more power than women in the Puritan church. The Baptist and Quaker movements were lay led movements. So they were not as keyed into ministerial authority. Um, and the, the Baptists believe it was acceptable for women to speak during church meetings, um, and they included women in church government. The Quakers allowed women to preach. Um, they considered marriage an equal partnership, and they enabled women to participate in church government. So there are more opportunity in these religions. So again, just another layer to, to look into to find out about women's experiences. Now, if you've gone to a living history museum or a historic site, odds are you at one time you've seen a woman, a reenactor dressed in period garb doing one of these activities. And uh, one public historian notably said that when you leave those types of venues, sometimes you come away with a, a much better idea of how to make soap or candles than you do about an actual woman's life. And so again, I think it's important to dig deeper. So women worked a lot. Yes, their days were full of work. Even women in the upper classes in the early years, they, they had servants, but again, there, there were not the, the extent of luxury items that would develop later in the period. But um, at this time, we have to think that this is a pre-industrial period, pre 
it's pre-revolution, um, the industrial revolution. And so men are not leaving the home to go to work. They're not going to offices. They're conducting their business from the home. And it was perceived as a woman's responsibility to act as a quote, deputy husband, to help her husband with this work when necessary. So women were expected to be cognizant of their husband's trade or business because they would have to step in if need be. So uh, if a man is traveling, and we have this examples of this on a very dramatic scale during the revolution when Abigail Adams's husband is off with the war effort. And of course, Mary Christian Lincoln's husband, Benjamin Lincoln is off. Uh, and so these women have to pitch in, they have to oversee the farmlands and the property. Um, and in fact, there's a, a, was an interesting quote about Mary Cushing Lincoln, um, a letter written following the revolution um, said that Benjamin Lincoln kept checking, the visitors saw ben, Benjamin Lincoln kept checking in with Mary about farm matters. And the, the author of the letter thought that it, this showed that Mary was the real master of the house. Um, which is you know, kind of a snarky comment, but she, you know, she'd been overseeing it for years while he was gone. But just that, those are dramatic experiences when a, a man's gone at war. But on a daily basis, there were plenty of opportunities where a woman just had to pitch in with her husband's business. Um, if he's out traveling, if he's sick or incapacitated, uh, many women kept accounts. Um, and there were other ways too. So uh, this example on the left, uh, Elizabeth Cameron White. This is just one example of a woman who ran a tavern with her husband. This is very common. And uh, we just think about that environment too. So we have this perception of women being at home. The domestic sphere is the woman's sphere. But really this wasn't entirely the case in the early colonial period. Yes, the woman was responsible for the household work but there was lots of traveling she ha would have to do too. She was very involved in the community because the, the household was not, could not produce everything it needed. That it's a myth about a household that was self-sustaining because no household could do that. So people were, were trading and they were going to the market and there's lots of travel. You read about people traveling all the time to conduct business or uh, see relatives or friends. Um, and thinking about a tavern environment, I think, is really interesting because you're not just, it's not just for your neighbors coming in and you're not just hearing about uh, community gossip, but you're, there are travelers coming in bringing news. And the colonial period was such a dramatic time period. There's so much going on. There are wars and political developments and social change. So there's lots of events going on and, and women cared about what was, what was going on in the wider world. And a tavern would be a perfect place to hear about that for a tavern keeper. Um, and here is just another example that the, the first uh, printing press was brought over um, in North America, British North America was brought over by a Mr. Glover who died soon after arriving and his wife, Elizabeth, was the one who operated, ended up operating the press for many years. Now, here's an, a final excellent portrait. Um, and this is Anne Pollard of Boston. She's supposed to be the last surviving member of the 1630 Winthrop fleet. This is painted when she's 100 years old in 1721. What's even more remarkable is she lived four more years. She died at 104 in 1725. And she and her husband ran a tavern in Boston and she did so for many years following his death. And I love in this will how she writes that she expanded upon the estate that he left. So she says, um, where the estate left by my husband is considerably advanced and bettered by the disbursements I have made thereon in buildings and otherwise. So in other words, she's buying property um, upwards to the value of 200 pounds, which is a lot of money at that time. And then she, she specifically says, paid for out of my own proper gettings by my labor and industry. So, uh, you know, just think about that. It's really amazing to just get this window into this woman's life. Um, she, uh, she obviously was a remarkable woman living to 104, um, but this also is an opportunity to talk about wills. Wills are a really wonderful way to find out, um, it's a, a one public way that a woman could make her private wishes known. And of course, married women did not leave wills because under the law, everything they owned would 
go to their husband upon their death, uh, with the exception of they you know, could leave um, personal gifts to people. And also some women did sign prenuptial agreements. This is most, uh, these are typically widows who signed them because if they wanted to protect property for their children. Um, but then another way to find out more about uh, women in this, just in this area are household inventories. So these were typically taken following someone's death. Um, now, this is Hannah Hathaway Cadman. She's the mother of Elizabeth Cadman White. Uh, the, I showed you the picture of the tavern in the earlier picture. Um, now, Hannah, I looked at Hannah's uh, inventory and also the one left by her husband who died decades earlier. She too expanded on his estate. Uh, but inventories are wonderful too because they can provide such an idea of someone's material circumstances. Some of them are very detailed. They go room by room and they enumerate everything that's in a room. So you can really um, help recreate a space in your mind what a person's living environment was like. Others are like this. They just, they list items. They don't say where they are, but still they can be really instructive. So as I said, Hannah uh, increased the value of her husband's death, uh, the, her husband's estate following his death. Um, she, we can see she was lending money. We have a, an entry here for money and bonds, uh, and that's a lot of money. And then there's a smaller one for rent, but also just looking at the wearing clothes. So this is a, a, a frontier area at this time, the Westport area, um, but she has these very expensive cl clothes. And then another item that um, sticks out to me is the silver plate. So silver was, it was very traditional for women of means to pass down silver items to their children and grandchildren. In fact, uh, Mary Mason Norton passed down a few items that are at the Museum of Fine Arts, some beautiful silver. So legacies. So this is a wonderful obituary for a woman who died in New Hampshire uh, in 1719. And she was in the 80th year of her age. And again, this, uh, this obituary sums up a lot of what was, what was considered admirable about women during this time period. So she, um, I didn't mention that to have a large family was looked upon as a, a blessing from God. Um, so sh this woman who she was blessed with so numerous an issue, that of her children, grandchildren and great grandchildren, she could raise two effective military companies. Um, and then it goes on to say, she was a gentlewoman of rare accomplishments. So she was educated. She was also well-skilled in surgery. And what she did therein was mostly gratis, charitable to the poor. So she also has a lot of medical knowledge and she's sharing of that freely with poor people. Um, she's of a meek, humble and pleasant temper. And um, that which crowned all, she was a sincere lover of true religion. So that is quite a testament to Mrs. Elizabeth Gilman. And then I just want to talk, uh, wrap up by talking about the resources that can be used for researching early American women's history. One of the obstacles that was often pointed to in the past for not researching women's, early American women's history was that, as I mentioned, not every woman could write. And so they didn't leave a behind um, too much in the way of personal writings, although there's absolutely material out there. But there are so many other sources we can look to for information. And there are also ways of looking at um, existing written documents in fresh, in fresh ways to get more information. So I talked to Michael Achille, the registrar for the Hingham Historical Society. I asked him, were there any 17th century um, uh, documents in the Hingham archives. And he said there were a lot, there wasn't much except for deeds. There were a lot of deeds that were signed by women. And so this goes to my point about this business being conducted from the home. So, you know, women are there, they're partaking in these transactions on a larger scale. Um, I often talk about an episode in Penelope Winslow's life where she and another woman who's visiting her they witness a, um, a, a transaction that's executed by the Plymouth Colony government enacted by her husband, who's the governor. You know, he's conducting Plymouth Colony work out of his house too. He's not just always going to Plymouth. And so she witnesses this, this transaction. And on the face of it, it looks like 
uh, it, it just has to do with the maintenance of a bridge. It looks very mundane, uninteresting, but it's a, actually it's a very important piece of Plymouth Colony infrastructure. And it really just demonstrates how women are, are really physically helping build the colony from the ground up. And so I just wanna conclude by telling you a little bit about my current project. So I became so interested in um, the Penelope Winslow's story as far as how is that the highest ranking woman in the colony, how she used that power and influence. I decided to look at the, uh, the first first ladies, the colonial governor's wives of the other original 13 colonies and see how they used their, how they leveraged their position to acquire personal goals, but also public goals. And I'm finding lots of evidence of how women really changed the course of history in the colonies by, by interacting with what was going on. And I'm also looking at their um, contemporaries amongst native women tribal leaders, and also the wives of what were known as black governors. So in early New England, there was a tradition of within black communities of electing a, a governor. And so this person would mediate disputes and uh, act as an intermediary with the white community. And it was a very respected position to hold. So I'm wondering what kind of influence their wives were able to exert. And so I just wanna end by giving you um, a, a, a two minute um, kind of elevator speech for the what I think is the value in this work. So I think everyone has probably heard about William Penn being the founder of Pennsylvania, but probably fewer people have, know that William Penn um, suffered a series of strokes and was unable to govern. So his wife, Hannah, was the acting governor for the final six years of his life. And then uh, following his death, she was the executrix of his will, so she was remained acting governor for the final eight for the eight years until she died. Um, the title was proprietor; it wasn't governor, and she wasn't governing by herself. There was a legislature, but during this time, she was able to maintain uh, relations with local tribes. She protected Quakers' rights, and she ensured that Pennsylvania, which was known as a peaceable kingdom because it allowed for a diversity of ethnicities and religions, she enabled this to survive. And I have to stay, say that there has not been a female governor in Pennsylvania since Hannah Penn. So I think this work, I think this work has some relevance. So thank you very much. And I'd be very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, fascinating, and uh, I, I've only started one of your books, but I'm eager to get deeper into each of them. I encourage everyone to ask questions using the Q&A feature. I want to get started with a couple, though. Uh, you mentioned these uh, folk traditions that while well, these were Puritan women, that in many cases they were holding on to folk traditions, including magic. Later, you mentioned a woman who was uh, a surgeon helping the poor. I'm just wondering if any of this um, information about treating illness uh, became mainstream, that was you know, maintained and, and handed down by women, if some of that became mainstream. Yeah, yes, it, it, it was. You know, it was these medical remedies um, were well known and they were widely used. And I think it seems like families tend to have their own twist on things too. You know, they had their favored remedies for particular ailments. Um, but yes, it was absolutely mainstream. And um, the, as far as the, you know, the, the magic, so that would have been kind of, that would have been frowned on by the ministers, but they too had a, a different, you know, it's kind of like a, a pre-modern worldview in a way. Um, so, so for example, in Mehitable Coit's diary, she has one strange item, the tooth of a dead man carried about you will ease pain. So that's something, you know, that's really bizarre. And that's a very clearly an old type of uh, belief. A, a minister would not have had that, but they, but their worldview was that they looked at everything in their environment as being a sign from God. So we could look at you know, some of their writings, um, ministers' writings and say, this looks supernatural, you know, like they believe in the supernatural to me. Um, so, but yes, the, the, the medical remedies became, they were mainstream. And in fact, many of them 
you know, many of these herbs and uh, botanicals that people used then are still in use now. And, you know, they have become more and more popular, as you know, in recent years. Um, so, yes. So also specifically, since we're coming out, we hope, uh, out of this time of COVID, uh, you know, smallpox and other things mm -hmm. uh, really, you know, hit hard at this time. Uh, but there were inoculations uh, mm -hmm. that I know in some cases, uh, it, you know, it was people of color that learned mm -hmm. about, you know, injecting live virus under the skin. Uh, women, I, I suppose, were treating their own families for smallpox. I don't know about women inoculating their own families uh, because I think they would have that, prof you know, professionally done. I don't think they would do that. But yes, it's such a good point too about the uh, transmission of knowledge between different groups. So yeah, so um, there is evidence that that women, colonial women, were picking up African, you know, treatments too, and in native treatments. Of course, you know, we think of when the pilgrim women came to, and there's all different types of plants here that they're, they're not used to using. And so they would have to find out from their native neighbors, what, what do you use? What works? So, again, you know, it's just such a rich history. I just, I just find that how when these strains come together, um, it, it just is so interesting and such a rich history. So Reverend Kelsch of, of Second Parish Church is asking, uh, relative to what you were just talking about, uh, do you think that native and African, you know, indigenous and, and African women would have interacted with each other or with white women in terms of sharing knowledge in any way? Absolutely, absolutely. Because again, we think think about it just on a daily basis. These people are in, in close quarters. Like as, as I said, um, just for example, the in Plymouth, they there there's the are these ongoing archaeological excavations, and they're finding more and more uh, that there is evidence of native items in colonial households and colonial items in native households. And a lot of times the, the people have repurposed them. So um, they're using them for their, they, they're taking technologies from different groups and they are using them for their own, they're adapting them to what they need. And so yes, absolutely the communication between the different groups because they're, you know, they're living in a community together and you're and the other woman wasn't, I, I, you know, the woman in the obituary, Elizabeth Gillen, I don't think she was a surgeon. I think that was just a way of saying that she was, you know, a, a very successful healer. But yes, they're, they're uh, contributing their knowledge and helping each other. So Ellen Miller made note of the fact you're talking about a woman who had increased, she was very proud apparently of increasing the value of the estate that her husband had left. Would she then have been able to influence after her death um, how that was used, or or would she have had the power to do that? Would she have been able to at least influence, if not dictate, how that was used? After? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so, and I should just say too, in uh, it was customary at this time for uh, women to have what were called dower rights. So, if a, a man predeceased his wife, he would leave her typically a third of his um, personal property and a third life interest in the real estate. And then that would go to the children upon her death. But in this case where, um, where Ian Pollard, she acquired more, right? Aunt, she made that very clear. She acquired that over and above what her husband left. Uh, she, she could have absolutely had jurisdiction on where it would go. She ended up just leaving it to her children. It was split, uh, I believe it was split evenly between her children, but. And she would have had, yes. Some research I've been doing recently on the Jacobs family, I was surprised that a family with a very large family, about 15 children, I think, of Captain John Jacobs, he left real estate, you know, actual mm -hmm. property, to quite a number of his daughters, including a mill. Um, and so I was curious if you think he was leaving that to them as making them better marriage prospects, or, or if you think it was uh, something that just would, would support them individually or? Probably, probably both, you know, um, that he, I, he probably just wanted to ensure that his children were taken, taken care of. And so if he was wealthy, as you said, he had all this property, um, he could afford to, to split it, you know, distribute the wealth. And, um, and, you know, I don't know about, you know, perhaps about making them better marriage prospects, but most likely just to ensure that they would be, they would have some income and be taken care of. So can you tell us a little bit about what we might see if we went down to the museum in, in Plymouth? 
to see that uh, exhibit that you've been part of uh, as a curator? Yes, yeah, so this actually, um, this was a little bonus from COVID because this, this exhibit actually opened in, was it 2019? And then it had to close, you know, because of COVID. And so they kept it up a little longer. Um, and it, it's a wonderful exhibit. And I'm saying this because Donna Curtin, who's the director of Pilgrim Hall, she did an amazing job just overseeing this. It's not just about Pilgrim women. There's women from each seven, century. So 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, um, we, don't, we don't go to the 21st, but, uh, it, and then there are, you know, there's just such a rich history in Plymouth not just pilgrim women and not just uh, native women, but there's a, a, a rich African-American history there too. Um, there are artifacts and there are also videos that uh, Donna oversaw. So those are great too. It's just, I think it's just very well done thanks to her. And um, Linda Coombs, who's a Wampanoag scholar was a consultant too. Great. So you talked about how women did work very, very hard. Mm -hmm. they, they married when they were young and they, they worked very hard um, and I've been as astonished by how hard they must have worked because they were teaching their children, they were making the clothes, they were managing the farm. As you said, they were kind of deputy husbands in terms of the business that their husband might have been conducting from home. And in, in Hingham, we know they could have, the husband could have been a shoemaker or a bucket maker, any number of things. Uh, so they had some role in that business as well. So, uh, and yet some of them lived relatively long lives. And I was wondering if you had any clue about whether it's diet or how much exercise they were getting because of all the work they did, any clues about why you think they maintained their health with these large families and all these students? Um, I think yeah, it, is, it is interesting because once a, a woman, you know, she survives childhood, and then survives her childbearing years. There were, there were lots of, and not just women, there were men who survived to be elderly too, but of course, you know, women out, just tended to outlive men um, like the, as they do now. I, I think that, I, do, I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, they, it was, the, the environment was pretty healthy. Um, if you're not living in a city, as I said, disease was really the number one cause of death. And so if you're not living in a congested area, um, you don't have to worry about disease as much. So um, I think just that, you know, <laughs> I don't know, the, the good New England diet and, and clean, healthy air, um, I, you know. I, yeah, so they're probably eating a lot of grains, I guess. Uh, would, would they have been eating, you know, the kinds of things we think are healthy now, greens? And uh, I think it depends, it really depends on the season for sure. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think just generally, you know, it was just a healthier environment. Um, so I don't think that it was, I don't think their, their diet was particularly healthy. I don't think it was that, you know, when you, when you go back, um, you know, how they have studies now about people who live long lives and some of them can be in rural areas um, I, I, and they're eating lots of greens. I don't think it was that. Uh, I, I just, I don't, I think it was just a healthier environment. So today we have advances, for example, we have advances in medical care, but then we also have problems with our environment, right? That impacts our health. So um, it's just a little bit, I think of a balance. Yeah. Uh, have you uncovered um, information about how women made the cloth that, from which they had to make the clothes? Was it one particular fabric uh, or was there a range they use imported cloth? Did they have to make everything? Oh yeah, so I think a lot of people, um, especially in the early years, were just were importing um, because again, it's time. As I said, you know, we have the myth of the self-sufficient household. That it never, it never happened um, because you know you didn't have the time, you didn't have the wherewithal to purchase all of the. Uh, not everyone could afford a spinning wheel, for example. Um, so they just, they did, they purchased a lot of, um, they purchased a lot of their clothing uh, in material. Oh, I see another question. You can, go, you can go very deep into that topic of textile history. Yeah. That's not my specialty, um, but you can, you can absolutely go, you know, there's a, there's a very full uh, body of scholarship on clothing and fashion and uh, just textile history, as I said, from that time period. But that's not something that I myself have, have dug too deeply into. Sure. 
Uh, so another question, one of the roles women played was that of midwife. Mm -hmm. How did they achieve that status, learn the skills? Could anyone take on that role? That's a good question. So, you know, you would need uh, serious training and uh, because it, and it was a very respected position in a community, obviously it was very necessary. And the whole, actually the whole rituals around childbirth birth are pretty interesting. So it wouldn't just be a mid midwife with you, you would have, you would quote, call your women. So your, your neighbors and, um, you know, might be an older daughter or older, you know, um, or relatives, but you would have a group with you. And at first, you know, it was kind of like a, a celebratory, you know, fun atmosphere. They used to have things like, quote, groaning beer and groaning cake, you know, to, that you would serve to your guests and you would have your child bed linen and all that. But then, you know, things got serious and uh, then the midwife would get down to business. And this was a, a, a space that was off limits to men. So, but yes, you would, you know, I think, um, again, that was probably an area where skills would be passed down from mother to daughter, but you would definitely need some type of apprenticeship uh, to, in order to, to learn those skills. So I don't see other questions coming in. Uh, uh, anything, uh, Michelle, before I wrap up, anything that you wanna leave us with uh, in terms of you know, just learning from these women? Um, no, I think, um, I think there's just so much more for us to learn and uh, that's all that I think that, um, you know, just thank you everyone for your time. And I just think this is a really an area that just needs lots, lots more uh, investigation because we really, we still to this day are, are focusing on how, you know, men built the country, but we can't ignore how half the population, you know, impacted the growth of this country. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Thank you. Then enlightening and enjoyable uh, hearing that not just the specific women that you've written about, but other women that, that you're aware of through your research. And thank you to the attentive audience today. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, joining all of these uh, sessions. Um, I just have a few reminders before we end the program. One, if you want to learn more about these particular New England women that Michelle has written about, you have the links to her two books, uh, which I have here and they're, they both look fascinating. Um, also, if you wanna plan a visit to the exhibit now showing at the Pilgrim Hall Museum, apparently that's gonna run through June and that's called Pathfinders Women of Plymouth. Um, also important to remind you that those of you who wanna join our post event gathering during this time that we have been on the Zoom, another Zoom link has been sent to you where you can all see each other and chat and Michelle expects to join for a little bit of that. So. Uh, please look for that as, as we end today. And last but not least, we have the upcoming and final program in the series, Benjamin Lincoln's World, <coughs> scheduled for May 16th, <coughs> excuse me, again at 3 p.m. And the topic which I'm looking forward to is Boston Light and 18th century New England lighthouses. There is a direct connection to Benjamin Lincoln in this and we have uh, Sally Snowman, uh, who was Boston Light's 70th keeper and the first woman to hold that position uh, is just a delightful young woman and she will be regaling us with stories about the history of Boston Light. Uh, so I, I hope you are all looking forward to that. So that is all for now. Hope to see many of you on our after party uh, on Zoom in a few minutes. And, um, and I see Deidre has just joined us. Anything you want to say, Deidre, as we yes, start off? Yes, thank you so much, Michelle. I'm just so grateful to you and Eileen for moderating. How did we not know about Hannah Penn? I mean, I'm just, it's amazing. Thank you. It was fab fabulous. All right. Thank you so much. And I see some other thank yous have come in over the Q&A, but yes. uh, no more questions at this point. So I'm going to sign off now. Thank you, everyone.